Again, beginning with verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him for being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint uh, for, him, for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons, and he invited them to the sacrifice. And when they came, he looked on Eliab, and he thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen this these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send him, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had a beautiful and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord says, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. In a movie called White Men Can't Jump, there was a guy sitting on a bench near a basketball court near the beach. I think in Los Angeles is where the scene is set. His name's Billy Hoyle. He's sitting there and he's looking pretty goofy. And uh, he's got his hat on backwards and he's got a goofy looking pair of shorts on and he's got these weird looking socks on and he doesn't look like he's going to be much of a basketball player at all. But when uh, one of the teams needs a player, they say, okay, which one of the teams is going to get this guy? And neither one of the teams wanted him, but one of them got him, and he's up there, he's doing all these weird-looking stretches and all of these little exercises to get warmed up, and they're thinking, oh my goodness, this guy's not going to be able to play. Well, when the game actually started, they found out quite different real quick. This guy was a former college basketball player, and he could flat out play, and he could shoot the eyes out of it. And the, the movie, it reminds me of the way people thought of Larry Bird when he first came into the NBA. There's a lot of players that thought, this guy is slow, this guy can't jump. Uh, he is not going to ever be a really, really good player, much less a great player uh, in the NBA. But, of course, Larry Bird went on to become one of the greatest of all time. And Dr. J, Julius Irving, said about him, if you bought that shit about him being the hit hick from French Lick for a minute, you were going to get beat because Larry Bird was a basketball genius. Appearances can be deceiving. I was listening to Baron Davis. Now, he played for Golden State Warriors for a while, and he played for the Charlotte Hornets for a little while. He made some all-star teams. Uh, he had a few really, really good years. And he said when he first came into the league, the guy that he underestimated the most and the guy that really took him to school was a guy named John Stockton who played for the Utah Jazz. He looked at John Stockton and he thought, this guy's kind of lanky, he's kind of goofy looking. Uh, ain't no way he's going to be that good. 
Well, he found out real, real quick when the ball was getting stolen from him left and right and when John Stockton was making layups, going around him and passing and getting assists and beating his tail off that day, that looks, appearances can be deceiving. And we see this here in the story of 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, here, as God has decided to choose another king, the story comes on the heels of the rejection of King Saul. King Saul had been chosen and anointed to be the king of Israel, and Israel demanded a king in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And there they, they were asking, not for a bad thing, they weren't asking for a bad thing, but they were asking for a good thing for the wrong reasons. You know, sometimes you can, you can ask for the right things, but for the wrong reasons. James actually, the book of James tells us that we should be careful how we pray, what we ask and how we ask, because if we ask for the, the good things for the wrong reasons, we're asking amiss. So Israel was asking for a king, but they wanted a king for bad reasons, and they wanted a king like to, to be like all the other nations of the world. What they were doing was that they were placing their trust and their hope in a human being, in a person who would be able to lead them. And instead of entrusting, trusting their lives and, and their, their future and their destiny to God. See, remember, God is trying to build a community of faith, and all along the way in this journey with this nation of Israel, He is trying to get them to just trust in Him. Remember even at the Red Sea, when Moses is standing there with Israel by the Red Sea and it looks like they have nowhere else to go and this huge army is after them, Moses tells the people as they're afraid, just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord for the Lord is going to fight for you today. And that's repeated all throughout the story of the history of Israel. God is going to fight for you. But here at this time in 1 Samuel 8, the people aren't really trusting in God. And they're looking to a king, and, and they're going to give this king tremendous responsibility. And they're going to put their hopes in a flawed person rather than in the flawless one, the flawless king of kings and lord of lords. So one of the worst things that can ever happen to us a lot of times is for God to actually give us what it is that we want. And here, God decides that, that even as Samuel protests and Samuel pleads with the people, God tells Samuel, go ahead and give the people what they want. They wanted a king, they got a king, and they ended up with King Saul. Now God warned them in the future the power that you're giving this guy, because when you give, you give someone the responsibility for your care, because that's what they wanted. They wanted security. They wanted... Uh, they wanted someone who could provide for them, who would lead them to a bright future. But when you give a person, a flawed person, all of this responsibility, guess what else you're giving them? You're giving them control. You're giving them power over your life. And God warned them, you're eventually going to become the slaves of this king that you so desperately want. And they eventually would. And they would have disaster after disaster. God gave them what they wanted and they got King Saul. And God's spirit rushed upon King Saul when he was anointed. He began to prophesy. And at first things were going great, but it didn't take long before God gave Saul a specific command. God's word came to King Saul. And instead of just uh, submitting himself to the word of God and obeying the word of God that he had, he decided that he could do it on his own terms. He, could deci he decided he could do it his own way. And that he could modify the word that he had received. And uh, instead of sacrificing what God had commanded them to sacrifice, he kept the best parts for the people and uh, kept those things for himself. And he was self-centered and he was selfish. And God, because he refused to obey his word, and because when Samuel confronted him about it, God knew this would happen Saul refused to admit that he had been wrong. He refused to admit. He, he insisted that he had done what he was supposed to do. He insisted that he had done all that God had commanded him to do. 
And he kept making excuse after excuse after excuse, and he would never humble himself to admit, God is right. Prophet Samuel, you're right. I am wrong. I need to repent. I need to confess my sin. He never did that. And all throughout his life, he continued that pattern of making excuses rather than making amends. Therefore, God rejected him from being king. And he rejected him specifically in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 16 here, God is choosing another king while King Saul is still presently king. And he brings all of the sons of Jesse before the prophet Samuel. And uh, all of these sons, the first Eliab, who Samuel is sure, this has got to be the guy. He's the oldest, he is strong, he's strapping, he's tall. This has got to be the one that God is choosing king. And God says, no, you're not looking at it the right way. You look on the outward appearance. You're basing your decision on appearances, but I see the heart. See, God sees the person's heart, and that, only, that, that doesn't mean he just sees their heart at that moment. God knows the person's past, present, and future. He knows everything that they will do. He has someone else in mind who's not even present. See, this, this guy, David, the youngest, he wasn't even on the radar at all. He was off tending the sheep because they thought, surely this can't be the one that God would choose. Yet, it ended up being David. This handsome uh, young boy, this handsome young man, who was, was that day anointed king. Now, he was anointed that day to be king, but he wasn't crowned for many, many years later. David, you know the famous story that David, when the army of Israel was under a siege by the Philistines and they were under attack with the Philistine army, he had this great, great warrior that his name, he was a giant named Goliath, right? You know the story that David defeated the great giant Goliath because he trusted in the Lord and the Lord worked through him when everybody else was about ready to cut and run, right? And David, from there on out, he would lead Israel to victory after victory as he served in the army, even of Saul, as Saul continued to be king. And he brought Israel great victory, and the more victory David had, the more jealous Saul became. And it got to a point that the Spirit of God completely abandoned Saul, and an evil spirit took up residence in Saul's life and in his home, and led Saul to a murderous, murderous rage. He tried at every opportunity, he would try to kill David, and David would have to flee for his life over and over and over again. And eventually Saul, because he refused to humble himself and to repent, eventually uh, he it was brought and his sons were brought into the severe judgment of God. And finally, David was crowned king. Now, David wasn't chosen by God for this task to be king because David was flawless. Okay, God has no other choice but to choose flawless people when he's choosing people among fallen human beings. Okay, He chose David because he knew David would not be flawless, but he would have, ultimately he would be faithful and humble to his word. But he would go on not only to lead Israel to great victories, even as king, not only to bring a period of prosperity and, and to establish the rule and the reign of Israel in Jerusalem and, and establish his, his palace, his Mount Zion on this mountain of Jerusalem, he would prosper above and beyond all that he ever could ask or think and imagine. Man, he, he was doing great. He was doing awesome. And Israel was doing great. But you know, it's during the times of our greatest success when we can face the, the most incredible temptations we'll ever face. It's during times of success and prosperity when things seem to be going all our way that we can face the greatest of temptations. So David, one day when he wasn't out at battle, he was standing out on the roof of his palace and he was looking down. See, Jerusalem, if you've never been there, Jerusalem is on a high mountain. And David's palace is there toward the top and he's looking down on all of these rooftops below. This is in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, long after he's been crowned king. 
And uh, he sees uh, this woman named Bathsheba. She was the wife of Uriah. She was out on a rooftop and for uh, ritual reasons she was bathing. Now, here you go. You're going to have to think about this to get this, some of you. But uh, Jesse's boy, when he saw Bathsheba, Jesse's boy wanted Uriah's girl. Okay. And he could not resist that temptation. He had Bathsheba summons and he ended up having an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. Remember, God didn't choose him because he was flawless. He had serious, serious flaws. He was subject to temptation just like everybody else. So he had sexual relations with another man's wife and ended up getting her pregnant. Okay, so sometimes that's bad enough. Okay, that's a bad situation. Sometimes, have I ever told you the solutions that we come up with for our problems are sometimes worse than what? The problem, the problem we got. And this is exactly what David did. Instead of owning up to what he had done and owning up to the mistake, he tried to cover up. And the cover up, as you've heard, is always worse than the crime, right? The cover-up is worse than the crime. So here, David plots and plans. At first, he summons Uriah, who's one of his commanders in his army. He summons him back home, and he tries to get Uriah just to simply go home, to have sexual relations with his wife so it can seem like the baby that's going to be born will be Uriah's. But you know, the ironic thing is Uriah was so loyal to David and so loyal to the army that he refused to go home. Now, for a guy that's been out in the field away from his family for a long time, that's some serious loyalty. It would, would, would be for me. I can tell you that right now. Okay? So that's some serious loyalty. And yet, in spite of that, he will not go home because he wants to sleep there by the king's door to do his duty as a soldier. So then David gets him drunk and tries to get him to go home. He won't go home. And in desperation, in order to cover up this crime, this sin that he had committed. He wrote a letter to Joab, the commander of the army, the overall commander of his army, and said, I'm sending Uriah back. And he gave Uriah this letter, okay? Think about how cold this is. This is cold and calculated, if there ever was something. Cold and calculated. He writes a letter to tell Joab. He seals it so it won't be open. To tell Joab, in the heat of the battle, make, your, make sure Uriah isn't in front. And at the, at the worst part of the battle, withdraw all the troops back, but don't tell Uriah. And he was basically handing Uriah his own death warrant. So David went from committing adultery, giving into that temptation, to now uh, committing premeditated murder. We're in bad, bad shape now. This one that God had said long before he actually became king. God had said, I'm choosing him because this is a man after my own heart. He chose this man who committed this atrocity. Now, I know the last few weeks I talked about the difference between intentional sins and unintentional sins. And it's incredibly important to understand the difference here. Intentional versus unintentional. And there's some nuances of difference that we've got to understand. Intentional sin is a high-handed sin where we rebel against God's commandments like Saul did. We basically rebel because we think we know better and we just refuse. We refuse to submit. We refuse to humble ourselves. And we stay that way. That's what we're talking about. Okay, That's the sin for which there is no sacrifice that will cover. Hebrews tells us that. It's this high-handed, apostate, rebellious type of a sin that we commit where we refuse. We just... You know, sometimes people are just, uh, they're afraid and they're ashamed because they got caught, but they're not really sorry and contrite for what they did. There's a big difference there. You can do something wrong and only be sorry that you got caught and you have to face consequences, but that doesn't mean your heart is right with God. So here, in this situation with David, it looks like he's in that state of mind right now. And we've got some major, major problems here in this story because a little bit before this, God had made a great promise. We talk about the promises of God 
a lot of times we forget. We don't, we don't even know what we're talking about a lot of times. We're thinking about some little, you know, all the promises of God are wonderful. All the blessings of God are wonderful. But there's some big promises on which we stand. When we say we're standing on the promises, there's some big ones that we're talking about. Promise to Abraham. Promise to Israel. Promise to the new covenant. And then the promise that God made to David. He promised David that he would have a descendant to sit on his throne forever. That he would be an eternal covenant. God made an eternal covenant with David. And here this man who, with whom God has made this eternal covenant seems to be so hard-hearted and so callous that he has committed premeditated murder and he is still just entrenched in his rebellion and in his sin. But God sends him a prophet. God sends him a prophet named Nathan. Okay, now, we talked about a guy, a king, who's got a lot of power. And Nathan, as a prophet, is going to have to go stand before this king who's already committed murder. Okay, you think that'd be a little scary for Nathan? You better believe it. And he's got the task of confronting David with his sin, with what he has done wrong. So he tells him a story. He tells him about this rich man who's got all of these sheep and all of these lambs. He's got this huge flock. And there's this one poor man who has this one little lamb. We're talking about Mary had a little lamb. We're talking about a guy who had one little lamb. And it was a lamb that he loved. That lamb ate from his table. Okay, I know some of y'all got cats that do this, okay? So don't, don't judge the man. Some of you might have dogs that do this. We, have, we, we bring the dog in as a vacuum cleaner at our house. Okay? Uh, <laughs> it comes in handy with little kids. So there's this one guy who's got this one little lamb. And there's a traveler coming through, and he's going to stay with the rich man. And the rich man, because of the, the requirements for hospitality in his day, he has to prepare a, a meal. So instead of killing one of his own out of his own flock, he goes and he seizes the lamb of the poor man and takes his lamb. Now David, and he kills him, and he feeds it to his guests. Now David is hearing this, and the blood is beginning to boil. He, you could see the, the blood boiling in his eyes. I mean, he was so angry about how somebody who could do this awful, awful thing. And he's like, we're going to get this guy. Who is it? And Nathan the prophet points his little bony finger, I can imagine, right in David's nose and says, you are the man. You are the man. And David was convicted. David was convicted of his sin when he was confronted with it. And he wasn't just sorry that he was caught. He became repentant and he was sorry for what he had done. He was miserable, not because he was caught, but because of what he had done. God didn't choose David because David was flawless. He choos chose David because he knew David would ultimately be faithful. Now David, who would go on to write so many of the Psalms that we enjoy in the book of Psalms, would also during this time write one of the most powerful prayers of confession that this world has ever heard. And it echoes so much of the other promises of God that we've heard already. This promise of the new covenant where God would cleanse His people, forgive His people, give them a new heart. Listen to how David prays here. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to Your steadfast love, according to Your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before you. Here the giant killer, the one who had faced the giant Goliath, had an even greater giant here to face. And it wasn't a giant out there. It was a giant of a sinful and corrupted heart in here. And he could not do what he needed to do 
on his own. He's crying out to God for mercy. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before you. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Listen to what he's doing here. He's doing the direct opposite of what Saul did. Saul kept making excuses. He kept insisting, no, I'm actually doing what God said. He tried to distort and contort and try to, to, to justify his actions. And here David's saying, no, God, you're right. Your word is right. When we talk about confess sin, the word confess in Greek is homo legeo. And that means same word. It means we agree with the Word of God, that our hearts are in agreement with the Word of God, what God has said. You're right, God. And then he goes on to say, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother did conceive me. He's saying, I was born this way. I was born in sin this way. I need help. Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all of my iniquities. Listen to this. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And he goes on to say, and when you do this, I'm going to proclaim your goodness and your grace and your mercy to everybody. There's a, there's a song that's been coming on the radio I've heard. It says, I'm just a nobody trying to tell somebody or trying to tell everybody about somebody who saved my soul, right? Here's what David is doing. Okay, because of what God is doing for him. What's the difference in his life is that he humbles himself to the word of the living God. He truly repents of his sin. And guess what God does? As God always does. As He always does. See, the unconditional love of God is when people repent, when they turn away from their sin, and turn back to Him. He'll never turn them away. Now, premeditated murder, what David did is pretty bad. Doesn't get much worse. God has to choose among flawless people. But He chooses people who are faithful. People who will be faithful to humble themselves, to repent, to turn to Him. No matter what they've done, no matter what they left undone, he'll never ever turn them away. Now later on, closing up here, David would write about the Messiah. He wrote so many of the Psalms about the Messiah. In Psalm 110, he writes about the Messiah, the one to come. The one that's going to be his son. The one that's going to be his descendant. And there in Psalm 110, he calls this one to come, who knows, David knows it's going to be his son, his, his great, 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 great grandson. Uh, have I ever told y'all about the storyline is in the what? Family. Family, okay. Everybody make sure we got that, okay. <laughs> so listen now. Even though he knows this is going to be his great, great, great grandson, he calls this one to come his Lord. And Jesus points that out. And Luke, Jesus points out, and he asked the question, why does David call his son Lord? You know why David could be forgiven? You know why Abraham could be forgiven? You know why Jacob could be forgiven? Why Isaac could be forgiven? Because, because they all trusted in the one that God would send even before he was born. They all trusted in Jesus without really knowing the name Jesus or Jesus of Nazareth, they trusted in the one that God would eventually send. And David, even before this one would be born, David called him Lord. And when you get to the genealogy of Matthew, of Jesus, it starts out by saying, Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of, guess who? 
David. And Jesus saves all of those in that genealogy and beyond. He was David's Lord even before he was born. He's my Lord. And he's my God. And He's our Savior. And I pray that He's your Lord. Truly a day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand as you're able as we close out today. If you need prayer for anything today, please come and pray at the altar.